Hi. All right, so continuing on with Chapter 12, I'd like to now talk about radioactivity and the equations that are used to model radioactivity. So, of course, radioactivity is the emission of radiation um, discovered by Becquerel in 1896 with lots of experiments conducted by Becquerel and the Curies. And, of course, the experiments showed that the radioactivity was the result of the decay or disintegration of unstable nuclei. The three sources of radiation are alpha radiation, beta radiation, and gamma radiation. Alpha particles are the emission of helium-4 nuclei that happens in very large nuclei. Beta particles are either electrons or positrons. Now we'll talk about the mechanisms for beta decay in a little bit um, and how the reactions balance. But basically, um, a positron is the antiparticle of the electron, and an antiparticle has the same mass as its corresponding particle, but the opposite charge. So a positron has the mass of an electron, but plus E charge like a proton. Um, and then finally, gamma rays are the emission of high energy photons, gamma, gamma ray photons. So those are the three types of naturally occurring radiation that can happen. So gamma ray particles carry no charge. So if they're emitted from a source and you travel them through a region of magnetic field, they'll just travel straight towards your detector. Um, alpha particles, though, uh, because of F is equal to QV cross B, of course, charged particles are going to form circles in magnetic fields. The positively charged particles will travel in one direction, and the negatively charged particles will travel in the other direction, the opposite direction. They'll form a circle going upward, the positive charged particles in this um, uh, schematic here, and the negatively charged particles will go downward. So you can tell the difference between gamma rays, um, positively charged alpha particles, and negatively charged electrons in that way. And also, of course, the positron would also be deflected upward. But because the charge to mass ratio is very different for an alpha particle versus for a positron, the amount of deflection that it would undergo would be quite different. So you could tell the difference between these three different sources of radiation with a good detector. Your alpha particles, those are uh, big and slow. Um, so they only go through basically paper when they're emitted from sources. So you can block alpha particles very easily. The only danger is if you ingest a source of al alpha particle or inhale it, then it can be uh, very bad for you. Beta particles, they can actually penetrate a few millimeters of aluminum. They're much lower mass and so um, they, with high speeds it takes more to stop them. In gamma rays, they can penetrate several centimeters of lead, so it's um, very important to be careful around that kind of radiation. Now, the um, equations that describe radioactivity um, are go like this. You have a certain number of particles that are going to decay in a certain unit of time. And that will, of course, be proportional to the total number of particles that you have. You can't have more decays than you have particles. Makes sense. So the number of decays per unit time from a sample, you could write that as the time derivative of the number of particles that you have, dn dt. And that's going to equal to minus lambda, which is your decay constant, times n. Your decay constant is a proportionality constant that basically determines the rate at which material will decay. There's some uh, radioactive material that's very hot and you have a lot of decays per second. You have a very high uh, or a very different decay constant than you do if you have uh, just a few decays per second for something that isn't very hot. Um, in this equation then, since you have this little differential equation, dn dt is equal to minus lambda n, you can see that the solution to this would be a decaying exponential. Because if you take one derivative of n naught e to the minus lambda t, you get minus lambda n naught e to the minus lambda t. So you get minus lambda times n again when you take your derivative. So that's the solution to our little differential equation. And what it says is that if you have a certain number of undecayed radioactive nuclei in a sample at a time t, then that's going to be equal to the number of radioactive um, nuclei that were undecayed at time t is equal to zero times this e to the minus lambda t. And of course your decay curves um, look like these exponential decays. Now the half-life is a useful parameter that gets cited a lot in the charts. In fact, you have an appendix at the end of your book that gives you the uh, half-life for a lot of different isotopes of elements. Um, so you can look those up.
uh, you'll need to do that for some of the problems that you'll be assigned in the chapter. You'll have to use the appendix at the end of the book maybe to determine the half-life. Now the half-life is the time interval during which half of a given number of a radioactive sample will decay. Half of the nuclei will decay. Okay, And since it's an exponential decay like this, it follows a uh, E um, 2.78182. Anyway, it follows the exponential decay curve like that. The half-life can be written in terms of the decay constant lambda as the half-life is equal to the natural log of 2 divided by lambda. And you would just set that n over n naught is equal to 1 half is equal to e to the minus lambda t. And then take the natural log of both sides and solve. So I encourage you to do that little proof for yourself. Prove that the half-life is equal to the natural log of 2 divided by lambda. And the natural log of 2 is just 0 0.693. So the half-life is equal to 0.693 divided by lambda. Now the decay rate or activity, um, we'll call that A, of a sample, it's defined as the number of decays per second. Because if you're using a Geiger counter, for example, or a radiation detector of any kind, what it'll do is it'll measure not the number of nuclei in your sample. There's no way to, to know that from the Geiger counter. It measures um, radioactive events, radioactive decay events. So uh, a decay will come in and you'll have your Geiger counter hooked up to say a computer for example and the computer will register the number of decays that happen in a given unit of time and that can be plotted. So the activity is actually a more useful term for radioactive decay oftentimes than the number of nuclei which is difficult to measure. So your decay rate, um, you can define that. You just take a derivative of your function of n, and if you do that, dn dt um, minus dn dt is equal to lambda times n. And so we define our activity as minus dn dt, just so we'll have a positive curve instead of a negative curve. That's why the minus sign is there. And it's equal to lambda n, which is equal to lambda n naught e to the minus lambda t. And then we just say that lambda n naught is the activity at time t is equal to zero, which would be a naught, okay? Um, the units of activity, the SI units of activity, are named after the pioneers of radioactivity. Um, so the Curie is a very large unit of radioactivity, as is perhaps befitting the Curies, who dealt with some really hot radioactive stuff and got a huge radiation dose. Um, so one Curie is 3.7 times 10 to the 10th decays per second. And then the SI unit of activity is the Becquerel, which is one decay per second. Okay, so one Curie is 3.7 times 10 to the 10 Becquerels. And the most commonly used units of activity are millicuries um, and microcuries. So that gives you an idea of how big the Curie um, is. I think it's helpful at this time to just work a couple of example problems. I think that'll help cement it in your head. So first example, potassium is a useful element in the human body and it's present at a level of about 0.3 percent of your body weight. Now some of that is going to be a radioactive form of potassium known as potassium-40. Potassium-40 has about a 0.012 percent natural abundance. And so the question says calculate the potassium-40 activity in a 60 kilogram person. Okay, so 60 kilograms, about 0.3 percent uh, or 0 0.003 times 60 kilograms gives you 0 0.18 kilograms of a person that is potassium. So out of a normal person like myself, you've got about 0.18 kilograms that's just potassium. Now, not all of that is the radioactive potassium-40. Only about 0.012 percent of that amount so 0.18 times 0 0.00012, giving you 2.16 times 10 to the minus 5 kilograms, um, is going to be potassium-40 in a normal person. Now you can look up the half-life of potassium-40 in the tables of your book, and that will give you a half-life of 1.277 times 10 to the ninth years. So it's a very long half-life, a few million, I'm sorry, a few billion years. If you convert that into seconds, then you've got 4.03 times 10 to the 16th seconds. Um, seconds is oftentimes more useful because activities are in Becquerel's and Curie's, which is an inverse second. So we went ahead and converted there. Now we need to con um, calculate our decay constant because um, we were given the half-life. So the decay constant lambda is equal to the natural log of 2 divided by the half-life. So if I perform that simple calculation, I get a decay constant of 1.72 times 10 to the minus 17 
inverse seconds. Now another thing that I need is I need the um, the total number of atoms. Okay, so I've given I've been solved for a mass of atoms, but I need the number of atoms in order to calculate an activity because the activity is equal to the decay constant lambda times the number of atoms. So I've got to do a simple unit conversion from a mass to a number of atoms. So I have 2.16 times 10 to the minus 5 kilograms, right? Now, um, I can use the molar mass of potassium-40 to convert from a mass to a number of atoms. So um, first I want to go ahead and convert to grams, which is a more useful unit for a molar mass. So I multiply times 1,000 grams per kilogram. And then I divide by my molar mass of potassium-40, which if you look it up, you've got 39.964 grams per mole. So I'm going to divide 2.16 times 10 to the minus 5 kilograms times 1,000. I'm going to divide that by 39.964. And then I need to convert from moles to atoms, so I multiply by Avogadro's constant, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. And that gives me the total number of potassium-40 atoms in a typical person, which is 3.25 times 10 to the 20th. And then all that's left is to solve for the activity by multiplying the number of atoms by the decay constant. And if I do that, I get 5,600, um, which would be, uh, in terms of activity units, becquerels. So 5,600 becquerels. All right, so that's the first example. Now, I'd like to uh, talk about the second example, um, which is about radiocarbon dating. But I'd like to preface that first by explaining a little bit about radiocarbon dating. So, of course, um, some radioactive elements were formed as the Earth was formed, and so their natural abundance has decayed over time because, um, for example, there's just not as much uranium around right now as there one when the Earth was formed because it has a half-life, um, and it's going to decay off with that half-life. So we still have some, but if we wait long enough, maybe not, you know, it'll approach zero as time t goes to infinity. But that's not going to get rid of all of our radioactivity because some radioactive elements are constantly being produced in the Earth's atmosphere. And carbon-14 is an example of that. What happens is carbon-14 is constantly being produced because cosmic rays strike nuclei in the upper atmosphere and that produces neutrons. Okay, These free neutrons then strike 14 nitrogen. There's a lot of nitrogen in our air, okay, so there's a lot of nitrogen around. When the neutrons strike the, the nitrogen, it knocks loose a proton and creates carbon-14. So about one in every 10 to the 12th carbon atoms is 14, carbon-14, and then the carbon-14 in the upper atmosphere will react with the oxygen and form carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide formation is a chemical process, not a nuclear process, like the formation of the carbon-14 in the first place. Now, plants um, are going to absorb uh, carbon dioxide as long as they're alive. Um, it's just what they do. And then animals are going to eat plants as long as they're alive, right? Or animals eat other animals that have eaten plants. You get the point. At any rate, our supply of carbon is constantly being replenished. So as long as plants and animals are alive, they're taking in radioactive carbon. And so if you look at the amount of radioactive carbon that a sample contains and compare it to the activity of a live sample, then you'll see um, how long that animal or plant has been dead. Okay, so you compare a live radioactive, um, a, a live activity of a carbon-14 versus a dead one, and compare the two activities, and you can get um, an estimate of how long ago that animal or plant died. And this is the basis of radioactive carbon um, dating. So to give an example of that. Um, 44 grams of petrified wood was found in a petrified forest, and the sample showed a carbon-14 activity of 100 decays per minute. So how long has the tree been dead in years? Um, the half-life of carbon-14 is 5,730 years, and freshly cut wood contains about 6.5 times 10 to the 10th atoms of carbon-14 per gram. Okay? So those are all the information that you'll need to solve. Now, our activity um, has been given as 100 decays per minute, um, a minute 60 seconds, which makes um, our activity 100 divided by 60, or 1.67 becquerels. Now our half-life was given in years, so let's convert that to seconds. 5,730 years is 1.8 times 10 to the 11th seconds. 
Calculating our decay constant then, natural log of 2 divided by our half-life gives us 3.8 times 10 to the minus 12 inverse seconds for our decay constant. Now, in this case, um, we need to solve for the time. And so our activity equation, a is equal to a naught e to the minus lambda t, we need to rearrange that equation to solve for time. You might want to check your algebra and make sure that you can follow through. But what you do is um, you divide both sides by a naught. You get a over a naught is equal to e to the minus lambda t. And e to the minus lambda t is 1 over e to the lambda t. So if you take the inverse of both sides, then you have a naught over a is equal to e to the lambda t, take the natural log of both sides and then divide by lambda and you have the equation t is equal to 1 over lambda times the natural log of a naught over a. Okay, so that's how we're going to solve for our time. Now, in order to do that, um, we need to go ahead and solve for our activity is time t is equal to zero. So if we do that, we have 6.5 times 10 to the 10th atoms per gram um, in wood that's carbon-14, and you multiply that times 44 grams, and that would give you, at time t is equal to zero, 2.86 times 10 to the 12 carbon-14 atoms. And then if you multiply that times the activity, then um, the, times the decay constant to get the initial activity, you have a naught is equal to lambda n naught gives you 10.95 becquerels, okay? So now we have a naught, we have a, and we can solve for t, given lambda, plugging it all into that equation, 1 over lambda, natural log of a naught over a, and we get t is equal to 4.9 times 10 to the 11th seconds, which would give you, in years, 15,560 years. Okay? Now, it's important to realize the radioactive carbon dating can't be used for things that, say, for example, millions or billions of years old, because then it would have decayed just way too much. But fortunately, we have other isotopes with longer half-lives that we can use, um, and the principles for uh, radioactive dating are very similar, regardless of the kind of isotope you've got. So you know the basics now. All right. Well, hopefully that helps. Um, and uh, let me know if you have any questions.